What's up YouTube, my name is Max Scott the Tracks, and today I have for you another rant video. Y'all seem to really like the last one, so here I am back with another one. And the question today is, lore becoming too complex for its own good? A PowerPoint by Max Scott the Tracks. Let's get into it. So we all know lore can be quite complicated, you know. You get these crazy ridiculous spell stacks. I'm sure you had to learn the game at some point if you're watching this. I'm going to assume you're a lore player. It probably took you a while to get used to the speed of the spells. There, there's a lot of intricacies to each of the cards. So the question I have today that I was asked by my wonderful, lovely girlfriend, you can see in the corner, she's currently in silver four or silver two, sorry. And she asked me, is lore going to be too complicated? Because as she's starting to play the game, you know, she sees the least Darius. Those are her favorite champions at the moment. And they're pretty simple. They say Darius, for example, you know, you get overwhelmed 10, boom. And he and he levels. You put, put your opponent nexus down to ten. He levels. Beautiful. And then she sees these cards like Cain and these new cards like Evelyn. New cards like Orn, where you have to like read four different cards. You have to read their origin. You have to understand what each of the keywords do. And it can be super, super overwhelming. And my question today is, how did we get here? How did we go from base set to this so quickly? And is this going to be an issue for the future of competitive Legends from Terra? So I think it's definitely an important question, especially for new players as we're trying to continue to grow the game. Where does the complexity become too much? So that is the thesis of this video for me. It's that complexity is not bad until it is. So let's quickly define complexity. It is the state or quality of being intricate or complicated. So inherently, that is not a bad thing. You know, complexity is what really brings a lot of people to this game is that there's very complicated board states. There's a ton of interaction compared to other card games that actually make it a joy to play. But at the same time, if you have too much complexity, you have too many keywords, the game becomes nebulous and unsatisfying. And I think we've all experienced this around board games. So, you know, you're at your friend's house, you're kicking it, you crack a white claw, a beer, a mixed drink, whatever it is. You sit down, you're all around the table. You're like, cool, we're gonna play this board game tonight. You know, you get a couple beers in, just catching up with the homies. And then you start looking at the instructions, start setting up the board. And at some point you all look at each other and you're like, you wanna play some Smash? You're like, yeah, yeah let's just go play some Smash. Cause it's so, it's at some point, the complexity of things, you know, especially if you're a new player, it becomes too much. And I've definitely experienced this a ton of times, you know, just playing something simple and fun can be the most rewarding. So let's compare Legends of Runeterra to other card games in terms of how they progressed from their base set to um, where they are today. So this is Mewtwo, base set Mewtwo. It has two attacks super simple card you can pretty much understand what it does just by reading the text there and i think it's very clear that this is you know base set card it's it's like the early cards of legends of runeterra you can tell basically what it does just by reading it and the text that is plainly on the card and then here we see around 2014 wait let me see oh sorry i think it was 20 2009 the stormfront dust Nord dropped and this is one of the most complicated pokemon cards i've ever seen um, very com dense te card text, very confusing. If you read Ectoplasm and you don't play the game, you're going to be like, I have no idea what I'm looking at, you know? And then below we see Blue Eyes White Dragon, along with a card that is so complicated, I can't even read it. It's got Synchro, Combo, Super Duper. You need a PhD in Astrophysicist and Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, like top decking Heart of the Cards to understand what this card even does. So... I think it's pretty clear that this is a common trend that card games tend to go through is that once they establish, you know, a pretty base audience for their game, they're allowed to make their cards more complex and as they develop over time and the audience de demands more uh, unique and interesting cards, that is something that's going to happen. So I think this is a very natural progression at, and my question is when does it become too much? And I think we can both agree that Yu-Gi-Oh is a great example of this. I look at a Yu-Gi-Oh card as somebody who doesn't play the game and I'm like, keep that shit away from me with a 10 foot pole. Like, I, I don't want to touch it with the 10 foot pole. I don't want to see it. I don't want it near me. And I think a lot of people can empathize and relate with that feeling where if a card looks just too complicated, it just pushes you away. And it's something that instantly as a new player or even a veteran trying to keep up with the game as metas develop, you're like, it's too much. I'm over it. So where has this started to happen with Legends of Runeterra? So I started playing the game in Rising Tides, you know, 
I Gangplank and uh, Misfortune had just dropped. Our Bilgewater was the newest set of region and I was happy you know the game was relatively easy to learn I was super tripped up on the spell speed system and the way that the turns flowed back and forth but after like three days I got the hang of it and it was pretty fun you know I, I played Hearthstone I played competitive Pokemon trading card game for like eight or nine years so I have a sense of how card games work and I was able to get the hang of it pretty quickly and then cards like Aphelios dropped shout out to Ruben Zoo for making one of the most complicated cards that I had seen in my early lore days and you have to read five different cards and remember their order and it's just a super complicated and deep champion to the point where it's like almost too much and I got very overwhelmed and frustrated playing against Aphelios decks around the time the second or third season was happening and that was a point where I found lore to be a bit like uh, a bit tedious you know just because i i don't even know what i'm facing at some point unless i play 100 or like 20 to 30 games of aphelios myself i'm not going to understand how the moon weapons flow together without taking so much time on my turn where that i'm roping each turn and this just gets to be too much so shout out to aphelios for kind of uh being the first of the most complicated champions where we saw him uh you know we saw the levs the, the developers push lore to a new place with Aphelios, in my opinion. And this is going to lead me to talk about two of my favorite games, uh, football, or if you're an American watching this, you might call it soccer, and Super Smash Bros. Melee. So what I find to be great about these games is that they're not only super, super easy to pick up. Like soccer, you have to know pretty much two rules. Don't touch the ball with your hands and get the ball into the goal. That You have an easy goal and you have an easy set of rules. And then for Melee, it's the same thing. If you know how to hold a GameCube controller, it's pretty easy to learn within like five minutes how to play Super Smash Bros. Melee. But the beauty in both of these games lies in their depth. Despite how simple it is on the surface, you can play these games for years and years and years and still find yourself seeing new new interactions, still find yourself, fi still find yourself having new ways to improve your own game. And there's no like skill ceiling essentially in my opinion to both of these games so it's a really beautiful expression of um competition and it's just a beautiful expression of self you know this is exactly what games are supposed to be in my opinion so let's port that into something like league of legends where i tried to play league of legends when i was like 14 because my friend kevin was like yo max i'm starting a league team and him and four of my other friends who already played league were like bro you gotta learn so you can be the fifth person on our team so young max downloads league i'm like fine whatever i'm on this little uh, laptop that my friend's dad gave me it's like it was his old work top work laptop and he gave it to me so i could play minecraft with his son and i'm trying to download league i'm doing that little ash tutorial where i walk through a bunch of random stuff and they put me on summoner's rift and they're instantly flaming me because i don't know how to buy items and like i can barely move my champion at this point and i'm trying to use q and i don't understand how to aim the q and i'm super overwhelmed and i had a bad time and i stopped playing league for the rest of my life but that does not stop that experience has not stopped league from becoming one of the biggest esports in the world probably in the probably the biggest esport in the world and being super popular you know i was lucky enough to uh be at the spring finals last semester of college and i was in houston so i got to go to the event shout out to mr emotional you know a little finesse but that's a story for another day um so yeah i saw how cool league of legends can be and it's like it was like the nba finals you know i've been to playoff basketball games and the energy in that stadium was honestly crazier than some of those playoff basketball games that i've been lucky enough to go to and league is not by any stretch of the imagination a simple game like i was talking about young middle school max was overwhelmed and had a horrible time playing league when he was first trying it and i'm honestly super grateful i never got into that addiction like keep it away from me just like Yu-Gi-Oh, keep it far far away from me i don't want to be that degenerate but i do understand that the complexity of league isn't something that stopped it from becoming one of the biggest games in the world which i find to be super fascinating compared to a game like football compared to a game like melee where they're very simple league was a very complex game and it also grew to have a huge dedicated audience of people who are willing to pay money to support their favorite league team you know especially in the early game early days of league of legends i think a super crucial part of it was that the game was so good that people were willing to put up with the, the high learning curve just because you know their friends tell them how much fun it is and they're willing to uh invest that time to learn the game and especially now that it's more popular there's even more resources for them to learn the game quickly and i think that 
really like allows it to be one of the biggest esports in the world. So it it got past that barrier of being so complicated, even though it was um, you know it, I don't think anyone expected League to grow to the sizes that it has. So let's talk about the the whole point of me talking about this is accessibility versus depth. So obviously for a game to become popular, you need a certain level of accessibility. Something like chess, where you can learn the rules within 10 minutes, learn what each piece does and have a game with your friend. Um, you know, I think I learned chess while I was playing against my dad at like six years old on one of those like huge chess sets that you see at like a park or something. And we had a good time. I, I understood it and we were able to play against each other. And yeah, so chess is very simple, but there's also grandmasters who take years and years and dedicate years and years upon years and years of their life to trying to master the game of chess and it's a beautiful art form once you get to that level because you learn more about who you are as a person so there's a ton of depth and i bring up chess because i want to ask you the question why do you play games and i'll just let that settle for a second just think in your head why do you personally play games For me, I know games are, you know, an outlet to express myself. I have a high drive for competition just based on having like an older sister. We were always competing. You know, I've kind of tried to psychoanalyze myself a little bit and especially playing Pokemon at a young age that even boosted up my drive for competition more being in a capitalistic society. Who knows? But the typical card gamer, I would say you've, you've heard of like the Timmy, Tommy, Tammy, whatever those three categories are. They're nerds. Let's just put it flatly. The typical card game player is a nerd. They're willing to deal with a certain level of complicated of, of complexity because they're they want to play the card game. Like it's not easy on the surface to play any com collectible card game. You need a deck of cards. You need a person to play with. You you need a couple different things, and it's a lot more difficult to get than like a chess set, for example. And then the rules are usually more complicated. So the typical card gamer already is more willing to um, have that inaccessibility than a lot of other people. And this is especially true for Riot Games where most of their products are for people who are willing to get over that barrier already. So I think where a lot of people see Lore's complexity as a weakness, Riot has said, once we get these people in, we have them Stockholm Syndrome where they hate the game so much because they don't understand it that they're gonna work harder to understand it, if that makes sense. like you you want to understand and eventually beat your opponent because it takes so much skill and it takes so much complexity so once you get past that point where you're getting that complexity it's incredibly satisfying and that's how most riot games are able to catch you and hook you because they are more deep than most of their competitors go something like hearthstone for example is i would argue is a lot simpler than runeterra so i think riot products they definitely go for that high complexity and then once we have you you're going to be a dedicated gamer you're going to be someone who sticks with the products for a long time and that's something i just noticed but back to legends of runeterra no more comparisons um when i started the game like i said the last digital card game or card game in general i had played was hearthstone and i started jamming elise darius and it reminded me immediately gave me that satisfying feeling of slamming the face with hunter uh face hunter using quick shots and just all those fast units that could attack immediately and it was super satisfying to play the spiders level the least level darius use decimate to finish them off it was just a great experience in general but then i never thought i would branch out and not be somebody who just plays aggro decks because even in when i played pokemon for nine years i would say the majority of that time i was playing the most aggressive decks i could whether it was stormfront machamp whether it was dark Rai ex yveltal whether it was um just like weird infernape blazekin decks lux chomp you name it. I was playing aggressive decks for most of that time. So I definitely saw myself as like a bit of a narrow card game player where I was always trying to jam the most aggressive thing possible to like dominate the game. But fast forward two years and you can see my champion mastery here. I've appreciated the depth. Like you can see Nautilus and Maokai. I go deep. Get it? Into lore. Because I love this game so much and all the different ways you can learn to play it. You see, I mean, there's definitely the fair share of aggro decks, whether it's Thresh Nasus or the Draven decks or Lurk. But at the same time, I've been able to branch myself out and learn more about myself as I play decks like Control and mid-range stuff like Ezreal Draven and silly decks like Timo Caitlyn. 
to where I never thought I would be the one playing those decks. So it was definitely a large learning experience and something that I found super satisfying about becoming addicted to the game is that I see more parts of myself than I did before as I try to learn these new decks. And compared to something like Hearthstone where it was so simple to just play cards on curve and be aggressive and that was simple and satisfying to me. And when I lost the control decks, I was like, cool, control stinks and I hate it. Whereas when I play lore, there's so much interaction and so much depth that I want to just explore so much more. And I love that aspect of the game and I think it's a, definitely a large strength. So actually we are going to talk about more comparisons, so let's talk about magic. How many keyword abilities are there in magic? How complex has it gotten? And how has that affected the growth of the game? Is the questions I wanted to ask because as y'all know, magic is pretty much the most popular competitive card game over the last century, two centuries, whatever it is. How, is it century? Decade? Decade? Whatever. Um, in the base game, there's 16 different keyword abilities, but over time, there's been hundreds of different ones in Magic. You can see here, I tried to compile a list based off the Wikipedia page I found, and it was just way too much, so I just put etc. Um, you can see some of these have definitely inspired the uh, Legends of Runeterra team. For example, I found Daybreak and Nightbound, or Daybound and Nightbound to be pretty funny. But my point being is that all these keywords, they've helped to build the Magic player base more than they've hurt the Magic player base by limiting them and like scaring them away from the complexity. Especially as Magic has a standard format, which I'll get into later. Whenever you go and play the game, you're not actually gonna have to know all these things. And um, I think it's really important, like, I've, I've read a lot of game design blogs and watched a lot of game design lectures, and it's important to keep things fresh and create new products over and over and over again, because if you're not continuing to push your audience further and continue to build upon the existing strategies in the game with unique, um, like, play patterns, your audience is going to get bored. And I think we definitely see that in a game like Hearthstone, which I'll touch on later as well. But I think it's definitely a strength of Runeterra that they've been aggressive and ready to continue to drop many, many keywords each set. I don't think that's a detriment. Based off like historical evidence and the case study we have with Magic, I think it's very important that you're able to continue to release new products and not limit yourself in that way. Um, so I think lore has you know a lot of comparisons here. You can see just in its first year or two, it's released quite a few keywords, different actions, conditions, triggers. Um, and it's quite nebulous, you know, like I said, my girlfriend was in silver. If I wasn't there to help her and explain certain keywords to her, she would be like a lot more frustrated than she is as she plays Runeterra. And it's not like I'm holding a gun up to her head and being like, yo, you have to play the game. No, she's doing it of her own volition and she's having fun. But she's definitely expressed to me that it's a complicated and it's a lot for a new player to take in as you're trying to learn the game like on its own, you know, just getting used to how the health works and attacks work and the time, the turn order and the spell speeds. There's a lot to it for sure. So I think this is definitely something that has the potential to drive new players away. But at the same time, um, you know, it helps that Runeterra is a digital card game because you can just simply click on the cards and understand at least kind of what the keyword may mean. Like if you have a decent level of reading comprehension, you can probably understand like what it, definitely all the base set champions do just by clicking on them and uh, hovering on the keywords but with <laughs> this last comparison i will do hearthstone um it's the simplest large card game you can get like i said there's not that many keywords they haven't released many over time i think hearthstone dropped in what like 2012 2014 i was in middle school i know that when i started playing and i think the reason we can see a big dip in the standard um, enjoyment of Hearthstone, uh, the standard formats enjoyment where most competitive Hearthstone players and streamers are now opting to play the auto chess mode battlegrounds is because they had such a limited design space that it just became repetitive. And when they start to get new competitors like Magic Arena, Gwent, Runeterra, it just becomes clear that there's more complex ways and more fun and satisfying strategies you can play if you go to another card game in my opinion. So when they limit themselves and try not to release new content and new keywords and new um, ways to play the game, it, limited, it limits their design space where that causes the stagnation because they only have so many axes where they can do new things. Because, you know, with a limited number of champions or her heroes in Hearthstone and a limited like level, a, a limited amount of keywords you can use, there's only so much the designers can do before 
they have to kind of put their hands up and be like, okay, well, we're going to start to, as we rotate, just recreate the same style of cards. So that I definitely see where the limited design space that uh, Magic has done the opposite of can hurt you. And even though it's more friendly to beginners, it definitely limits the longevity of the game, in my opinion. So, and also that encourages the designers to lean towards things like high levels of RNG to continue to make the game entertaining, flashy, and uh, keep that like cheap, that cheap like, oh, I hit face under face, 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 like play my Union Song Curve, have fun. To, to continue to satisfy that cheap like uh, satisfaction, sorry, satisfy that cheap, to continue to satisfy that like dopamine that you get from just seeing the fun cards played and doing the strategy that you enjoy personally, I think it's definitely like, it encourages them to do more degenerate things, to continue to up the power level and to continue to just make more non-interactive strategies, I'll put it like that. So if you're getting overwhelmed, the rotation that Runeterra is happening, that Runeterra is introducing soon might help you. Okay, overwhelmed might you hate don't click off the video don't click off the video please please i have a family to feed i don't but imagine i do have a family to feed please don't click off the video i know i know it's bad it's bad so what i just pulled this random reddit screenshot what is rotation and why is it good for the game one reason rotation might be good for the game is because it's going to limit the amount of keywords and new strategies that you have to understand to actually get into the metagame and start playing in ranked uh, Runeterra. So like, obviously if Runeterra continues down this path and they have a hundred bajillion keywords, there's things they cannot continue to do and it becomes problematic at some point. But at the same time, um, you can still use those start. sorry. My point being, rotation helps keep a limited pool of things that new players and players getting back into the meta have to learn, which is very productive and helpful. And we've definitely seen that in Pokemon trading card game and magic that when you rotate out the degenerate strategies or things that may not be um, what the designers want to work off of and iterate anymore, it helps the game to continue to be fresh and evolve in productive ways to continue to get that play, that, that, that play uh, experience that you want to deliver to your players. So I think rotations definitely might help if you're overwhelmed. All right, I'm stopped. So let's talk about when I was eight years old learning the Pokemon trading card game. So, you know, I was like very young. I had decent reading comprehension. I was pretty decent at math for an eight year old my age. But I would see and go to these tournaments, right? You know, like I, I went to a regional championship. And even at that young age, like playing like, like these cards are just like bricks of text, right? This card was out in 2006. This was one of my favorite cards. Um, unknown G, like they're, they're pretty complicated cards is what you can tell. But even at that age, I was motivated by my love for the game. Like I said, card gamers are kind of nerds. I was motivated by my love of the game to try to understand these cards and not be scared away by the complexity, but to actually embrace them and love and enjoy using these strategies for myself. So I could definitely see where like you may read these cards and be intimidated and be like, uh, this looks like a lot, it's overwhelming. But for me, I love the game so much that I was willing to put up with a certain level of complexity because it was fun and it introduced new strategies to the game in a really interesting way where the dynamic between me and my opponent shifted. So I definitely, even as a young eight year old, somebody who, you know, it, I could have very easily been like, bro, I'm gonna go play like a shooting game or do something more fun that gives me like that immediate, you know, satisfaction. I definitely took the time to learn and understand the card game and read all these complicated cards because it gave me a deeper sense of satisfaction where I was like, I can now use these to my advantage and understand what my opponent's doing and understand where I can counter them, etc., etc. So I want to talk about that in terms of lore. So, you know, when I started the game, I hated, hated with a fucking passion playing against puff caps i hated them i really did they were one of my least favorite archetypes to play against i would lose to them all the time because i didn't understand how puff caps worked and i was like jesus like obviously i'd never played a card game where you could have something like traps Im implemented because that wasn't in hearthstone and that clearly wasn't a physical card game because that doesn't make any sense so every time i was playing like puff caps i just didn't understand what was going on i didn't understand where the traps were in my deck i didn't understand why i would draw so many of them 
it was just a terrible gameplay experience. And then you fast forward two years later, and I'm the best Puffcat player in the world, as you can see here on this Runeterra AR screenshot. I have the highest win rate with the deck, over 60 matches. I, it, I'm just a really, like, it, I somehow became, like, like I said, that Stockholm Syndrome where you hate something so much that you want to understand it and you want to love it. And I became so enthralled with the unique strategies you can implement with Puff Caps, whether that's, you know, baiting your opponent into trying to kill your Teemo, whether that's like being aggressive against the control deck. There's just so much like minutia to it that is so, so satisfying for me. And I've turned out to love the card, the the Teemo and the Caitlyn. And it's just like, I'm, I'm at a loss for it. I love Puff Caps so much. And I think I probably will for the rest of the time that I play Lore, because it's just such a satisfying strategy to me. And that dedication that Lore has implemented, like I've been talking about, it was something I never expected from the game. Because the complexity of Puffcap scared me away at first, I've since learned to love it. And it's something that I think we can all empathize with, especially when you compare it to like, let's watch talk about watching Arcane. Like, on the surface, this is a very simple show. It's a struggle between the poor people in Zaun and the rich people in Piltsover. But when you get into it and you consider all the socio-economic, all the political relationships, all the um, romantic relationships between the characters, suddenly there's such a deep and rich, lovely story that you get to enjoy because you're willing to enjoy and watch that complexity. Instead of something, you know, obviously like something like reality TV, you don't get those dynamics. Like, that's why I think Arcane is getting so celebrated and has become such like a, a beautiful thing because on the surface it looks like a really simple story but once you get into it it's so rich and complex and it's something that we can all empathize with whether that's like the struggle between the sisters or like the political machines wherever you may sit in those situations like it's such a beautiful story for that reason and i think riot recognizes that once you get people into your game or into your story or into like your stadium whatever it may be these dedicated audiences are things you want to capture because when you add that depth, it's just something that's going to keep these players around, keep, keep these viewers around. I think we're all waiting in bated breath for Arcane Season 2. If you haven't watched Arcane, go fucking watch it. Come on. It's, it's, it's an amazing show. But enough Riot fanboying. My point is that these dedicated audiences that are brought to the table by the complexity and this, the simplicity, but also the complexity are very valuable. So I don't want to say that it's bad but yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much what i have to say um yeah i think i think that's the end of my rant i think simplicity like obviously i would prefer riot tone it down just a little bit because i think there's still a lot of growth growth and i prefer the elegance like we can go back a bunch of slides i definitely prefer the elegance of a champion like fiora like elise like thresh where on the surface they look super simple but once you get into those interactions and your opponent's trying to stop you from leveling thresh but also needs to block your damage like it gets very rich and complex or your opponent wants to kill fiora but they have to play around your deny and they also have to consider do they have single combat or concerted and they also have to combat your combat tricks like and then they realize oh if i pass like it gets you into super complicated positions despite how simple it is on the surface compared to cards like Orn and Kane and Evelyn where their complexity really comes from they're doing a lot of things in my opinion like Kane cool you strike twice and he levels but I feel like that's not the same like elegant beauty as something like Fiora has and maybe this is me being a lore boomer but I would just request Riot to try to continue to uh have that level of elegance to their game to continue to farm that dedicated audience and attract the people who are just in for a simple card game experience to become more infested so yeah i think that's pretty much all i have to say i really appreciate y'all for watching uh this video was heavily inspired by a video by dupli that was talked about the art of dumbing down media whether it's a j cole album or kendrick lamar's early music you know he talked a lot about how they developed their art throughout their career to reach a wider audience but while still maintaining that complexity and i thought it was really wonderful so i'll have the link to that video below as well and yeah thank you guys so much for watching and listening to me rants i hope you enjoyed this one as much as the last one if you think complexity is a problem comment below if you don't think complexity is a problem tell me why as well um, my name is Max Got The Tracks. If you want to find me on any social media platform, the link will be below. And yeah, thank you guys so much. And until I see you next time, remember, I'm not responsible for your LP. And goodbye.